So, okay. First feature film directed by an African-American woman, like no big deal. Um, in 1991, but obviously a film like that, or like any film, which is part of what we're going to talk about today, what it means to make a film, uh, takes a long time. It's not a fast thing. It doesn't happen, you know, 1990, released 1991. It's not how it goes. So, as we know, you wrote, directed, and produced. Alva starred as Eula Pizan, and AJ was our DP and co-producer, I believe. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit today about these various roles and what it means to make a movie and what it meant and still means to make have made that movie. Um, so Julie, I'm gonna start with you. How did, where did Daughters come from? That's a very broad question, so yeah. you can answer it as broadly as you like. Okay, it came from my wanting to create a film of that was an authentic African-American film, a film that was uh, evocative of the Gullah Geechee culture um, in a way that we've never seen it, uh, anything like that depicted before. And also because my father comes from that region and his mm -hmm. family, and I had a lot of curiosity about the culture growing up in New York City. Okay. Um, what is the culture? What is Geechee culture? The Gullah and the Geechee are uh, the descendants of African Americans who worked on the plantations in the Sea Islands of the South. And they lived on the islands and uh, because of their, uh, the islands were remote and they were separated from the mainland, they were able to maintain much of what their ancestors brought with them from the various uh, West African uh, countries from which they were taken. Okay, so you guys shot um, for 28 days, which sounds incredibly short to me. Is that, is that short in film land? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? That's very short. 28 days on St. Helena Island off South, Car off South Carolina's coast. Um, so before we get into that experience, just how did this crew of people, and I know it's a much larger crew of people, but how did this crew of people come about? How, and Alva, you can tell us yourself. AJ, you can tell us yourself. How did you find Julie and vice versa? Julie, Julie found me. Great. How? <laughs> Through Lisa and Rodeo Caledonia and AJ and Greg Tate. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if Greg Tate is here, but personal shout out, thank you, Greg Tate, because I feel like you brought me to all these people in some way, shape, or form, through your work and through your person. <laughs> yeah, it's a long continuum of, um, I was thinking about that yesterday when um, I was watching the people speak and having grown up in New York myself and having attended the Studio Museum of Harlem um, early on in my la last year in high school and having just come in contact with so many different people who impacted so deeply upon my life. Um, and they're all here this weekend, too. Yeah. Um, and so, so it was, it was kind of like a natural occurrence of that we all came together. Yeah. I'm going to interject very quickly just to say we had a day-long symposium here yesterday, which if some of you were here, it was incredible. You know that. If you weren't here, it's OK, because it was recorded, and you can watch it online. Some maybe, I don't know how, but <laughs> someone will know how. Um, and we had a really wonderful day where we talked, had different people talking about their different experiences. Um, so that's just the context for what she meant for yesterday, but go ahead. Um, well, maybe I'll just provide a little, maybe nuts and bolts context. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, when I first met Julie, I guess I'd seen uh, Illusions. And uh, Diary, I think I'd seen Diary of Africa 9 too, but I know I'd seen Four Women. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years, she had had uh, a project that was supposed to have four parts, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Correct me. It was going to be an omnibus film, uh, anthology film that had four sections dealing with black women at four different points in uh, history. Uh, that was good. She had done Illusions, which was set in the 40s. She had a script for one that was set in the 60s. Uh -huh. That was one that was set. <laughs> that was one that was set in what was then the future, which I think was 2010 or something. Like that. <laughs> it's like way in the future. I mean, she said, "This is going to be a." science fiction story way in the future. 
And, uh, and that was one that was set uh, at the turn of the century. And that was what really started, grew to be daughters because I remember Julie showing me the script. And at a certain point I was like, wow, it just seems like you're doing so much work on this. Maybe, maybe it should just be a feature. And uh, it kind of went back and forth. And at a certain point, it just seemed like that made the most sense. So I always like to think it started as a seed for a four-part thing and eventually just grew into a feature on this song. Because it was Eli and Eula at first. Yeah, before it became Daughters of Dust. So. And Eli and Eula are the couple. Eli, well, Eli and Eula. Um, so Alva, can you tell us about, so, okay, Julie found you, fine. But what were you doing at the time that Julie found you? Um, and how, yeah, what did it mean to you to come to be in Daughters? Well, um, I was uh, performing, uh, working as a musician, composer, improviser in the downtown New York scene uh, and uh, performing a lot at the Knitting Factory, uh, the Kitchen, PS122, and, uh, and then, you know, Lisa and I were collaborating and we formed this group. Lisa is Caldonia. Lisa Jones, Lisa just Jones. for everyone's reference. <laughs> Author, and playwright, etc. Yeah. Yeah, and actually she and I, we went to high school together. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Kelly Jones and I went to high school together. And Kelly and Lisa are sisters, and so we all hung out together. Um, and so uh, one, of our, one of our performances was reviewed in High Performance. In fact, a couple, and I know there was a photograph, and I, I think that, I remember Julie telling me that someone saw my photo, AJ saw my photograph, <laughs> and uh, he, Julie said. Obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, from that image, that was the image, that was the vision of Eula. So um, that's how I came to, the, to this pro project. Um, and a lot of these, actually, these images are in the show upstairs on the fourth floor, if you haven't seen them, including this one that you're talking about and the review in High Performance, which was written by Lowry Stokes Sims, who is an incredible curator. Um, and shining light in this world and in this field. So that is amazing. Uh, uh, can, can I, I want to say something. <laughs> um, so like one thing, one thing I remember, uh, like think even just running through the show really quickly and seeing uh, just the, the photo from the high performance and then that spread from Energy Magazine. Um, I always, that was a moment, you know, there was a lot of excitement at that moment because you had the BRC, you had Rodeo Caledonia, Public Enemy, Spike, She's Gotta Have It, that was huge. It was just a huge moment. And like, in a lot of ways, I always felt like Daughters was this project that was trying to bridge, I don't know if maybe schism is strong, too strong of a word, but to bridge like the black LA Rebellion sort of film set and the sort of Spike and post Spike film set. Cause I associated Spike with like, I mean, you guys all knew each other, I mean, I think the first time I met Alva is down in Atlanta, you guys were on school days, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so Daughters had a lot of things built in the project, in the structure of the project that was supposed to, you know, be like inside, inside kind of stuff, like the female cast, like Yellow Mary, uh, Barbara o. Jones uh, was a very, not, not her, that's KC, but Barbara o. Jones was a, a very iconic figure in the UCLA Rebellion thing from Bush Mom and things like that. Casey Moore was the female lead in Killer She and uh, the grandmother, um, God, my brain is going bad now, was, uh, um, uh, was in Passing Through. Yeah, Coralie Day was in Passing Through. And so we then at the same time wanted to have, like, you know, Tommy Lee Jones, who plays a photographer, she's got to have it. Alva had been in school days, and Joa was supposed to be in it. She was actually the initial person who was supposed to ride away on the horse. But they were shooting um, uh, Mo Better Blues at the time, and the schedule kept changing. And at a Joa certain Lee. point, we just had to, re yeah, Joa, we had to recast her. So, so we're supposed to have all of these figures that were sort of iconically, that were supposed to make it clear that the choices that we were making, what we we're trying to do aesthetically and whatnot, were like intentional. It was supposed to be like very intentional. Um, and so speaking, I was going to ask you, Julie, about the L.A. Rebellion, actually, and about your kind of relationship to that earlier generation of filmmakers and your own kind of trajectory as a filmmaker. So thank you, A.J., for setting it up. 
Okay, so uh, when I arrived at um, UCLA, I was coming out of AFI, uh, the American Film Institute. And while I was at AFI, I actually began working with Charles Burnett and Larry Clark, and, and they were part of the LA Rebellion. And that's how I met um, Barbara O, oh, who played Yellow Mary, and who also played in Diary of an African Nun. And I also met Coralie Day, who eventually would play um, Nana Pazant. So um, the LA Rebellion, of course, was not called the LA Rebellion while we were there. That came years later. But it was a, um, a time when um, a group of independent filmmakers, we were making very bold moves and experimenting with storytelling. And Barbara McCullough was one of them. And Barbara McCullough is part of this exhibition. Barbara McCullough was there, and Barbara McCullough and I uh, eventually, uh, we went to the Cannes Film Festival and, and, and to the market and put on a show with, L with films of the people who were in the LA Rebellion, and we did this in 1981. Uh, so it was, um, it was a great time to work with people and to, and to be inspired and to, and to build our confidence, and I knew that I always wanted to work with the actors who participated with us in all of our um, independent films that took so long to make. And so that's how we, we had them in, also in um, Daughters of the Dust. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about the kind of, because one of the things that's really, I think, still striking about Daughters and that we don't still see very frequently in film is the kind of very non-traditional structure, the narrative structure, um, the way that the, there is a narrative, obviously, there is a story that's happening, there's forward motion, but it, the film happens in a very short period of time in, in the characters' lives, mm -hmm. um, but also just the experience of watching it is a very kind of non-linear, ethereal kind of Ceremonial. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, ceremonial. Yeah, ceremonial. Um, can you talk? Rite of passage, yeah. Yeah, can you talk about how you came to that and whether that was always a part of it, um, and yeah. Yeah, um, well, like I mentioned, we were looking at, um, at the time, the independent filmmakers, we were looking at various ways of telling a, a story that is not necessarily told in a Western way. So for me, um, the structure that I use in Daughters is uh, my griot structure, my griot story structure, and it's told in a way that an a African griot would recall and recount a family's history. Um, it's told in, and so it was very important that this structure had a very specific look to it. You know, the, so we studied tableaus, AJ and I studied tableaus, and also uh, the production designer, Carrie James Marshall. So the three of us pretty much worked with our heads together for, for a long time before we began shooting to come up with a design, a style of design that was complementary and supportive of the structure of the story of the vignettes that we would be showing and telling. Um, and so AJ, can you, from the perspective of a DP, can you tell us of some, and you know, can you speak for Carrie a little bit, because he's not here. Um, what are some I'm of the used things? used to speaking for Carrie. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, Carrie, we invite, he was, he was busy, but we invited him. So it's not that we didn't want him, don't, don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, just what are some of the, the very kind of, kind of nuts and bolts things that you guys did on that end to well, kind of create um, this vision and to create this overall structure? Well, um, I met Carrie just because Carrie had just had his first show at the uh, Copland uh, Gallery in uh, LA. Copland, yeah. yeah, and um, it was uh, just, there was an interview, <laughs> there was an interview in the LA Weekly, and it was just really funny. Even now, just thinking about it, it just makes me laugh. He just said a lot of really funny things in it. And I was just like, who is this guy, you know? And I think I asked around, and uh, actually Ben Caldwell, who also was at UCLA with you and those guys, said, oh yeah, I know Carrie James, he just finished at Otis Art Institute. And so he gave me Carrie's number and I called Carrie and we just hit it off immediately. And uh, I think over the next few weeks, me and Carrie was hanging pretty tight. And at a certain point, I was just like, Julie, I think we should ask Carrie to maybe do the art direction on this. And I remember Julie said, has he ever done it? And I was like, yeah, no, but you know. <laughs> But then neither had I, so. <laughs> uh, but I just know Carrie is like, anybody who knows Carrie is, uh, or even if you know of him, he's legendarily thorough, let's say. He's very, super, super thorough. So it was clear that if he committed and you know, agreed to do it, that he would 
do a, do a great job. I think I don't think we knew we were getting uh, the master of mastery or anything at the time. You know, I like to say he might be the uh, batting percentage wise, he may be the greatest uh, production designer in the history of cinema because he's only done two films: The Daughters of Dust and Sankofa. No, he did Praise House for me also. Features, I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it counts. <laughs> Mere features, sir. Um, so, so like, uh, so basically, early on, if I, it was just, you know, me and Julie had a very intense back and forth, as she said, we had all these pictures that we would trade back and forth, and then Carrie just kind of got looped into that. So it was like, you know, a real triangulation. Like, we went down the first time, because we actually shot twice. Uh, we were trying to raise money. We had moved to Atlanta at that point, and uh, we uh, tapped out at about $35,000, if I remember correctly. And I, I remember us having this conversation, like, should we wait for another granting cycle? And it was like, no, nah, let's just go for it. And we knew we didn't have enough to finish it, but we might have shot about 40%. I don't know, it was closer to 40 You don't think 10% just? No, saying? because we, didn't, we couldn't use any of that footage because we changed the costumes. Yeah, I know, I know. But I, I mean, but we shot, we shot a big percentage of the, we shot a big percentage of the script, actually, though. But, but the point being is that based on we got that footage together, and then right afterwards, this was just kismet, really because uh, Julie cut a trailer together for it and they had this thing at Sundance. It was a women producers conference? Yeah, it was a, but yeah, exactly. And because I remember the first time we shot, we had your, uh, Alva's stomach was too big. <laughs> As a pregnant you, it was huge. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> we cut back on the pregnancy. <laughs> yeah. But like we went down like with a micro crew though. It was just me, Carrie, Julie, Bernard, it was like really maybe five, six or seven people maybe in the crew and in the cast. Carrie came down and he brought Cheryl with him who really wasn't in the film at that point. Carrie kept saying, I think you should consider her. She has that look. She, I think she has that look. She that played you guys Viola. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I remember Greg came down and Suzanne Miles, a couple of friends came down just to visit while we were shooting and we shot what we did and then Julie cut the trailer together. And, um, Lynn Holtz. And then it was Lynn Holtz at American Playhouse, who uh, American Playhouse had just begun uh, doing theatrical films. They did about three or four of them uh, because they were known for doing television movies. Uh, uh, they did a short series of theatrical films, and we were able to convince Lynn Holtz and, and Lindsay Law to right, uh, finance Daughters of the Dust. Like, my early funny story I remember about the structure, so just to go back for one second to the un unorthodox nature of the structure, is like, I think they said something like, okay, we want to do this film, and then Julie was doing rewrites or something, and we went to New York and met with Lindsay, and uh, they were like, yeah, we love it, it's great, but we have some problems with the structure. It seems like the film has three endings. Uh, it is, and, and it does, it ends three times, you know, it ends, when they have the big Bible get together, then it ends. When the kids, they ride off on the horse and the family leaves, and then it has that last end with the unborn child and stuff. And I just remember distinctly saying to them, it was kind of, I think it was inspired, but I said to them, I said, oh no, it's, this is like James Brown. You know how when he finishes his show, he kinda, Encore. He kind of goes off, and then he throws the cape off, and then he comes back. And they said, oh, okay, and we never had any more. <laughs> We never had any more trouble with them regarding the structure, so they sort of just bowed down. So I just I was going on that. That's a, that's a true story. <laughs> it's a true story. Well, it's a good story. Um, so you did all you got your financing, um, and you went that you'd already shot a bit, but then you went down again with now your your real cast and your you know your real maybe you had your real cast real costumes real cost. Oh yeah, sorry, I was going to ask about that. What the costumes are such an iconic. I mean, we can see them here. It's such a striking image, these, these dresses um, and the hairdos, and I mean, there's so much to Daughters that is obviously very, very inspiring to people today. We don't need to explain. Um, yeah. But so, so can we I talk a little to, bit? I, I have to Go. mention the hairstyles. Um, um, Pamela Farrell uh, is the, has a company in Washington, D.C. called Cornrows and Company. Uh, she came down and worked on the heads of everyone <laughs> and it was she, she did a wonderful job she created new hairstyles and, and recreated ancient ones and it was um, 
You could talk about it. You, talk about it. you just said worked on the heads, not the hair. <laughs> it's very southern. She worked on it, going to get the head. Um, I mean, is she, is that a company that's still going? Cause oh, yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, Pro. good, thank you. I would like to go. No, I mean, <laughs> I've tried to recreate some of the hairstyles without success, so. Um, okay, and I then mean, the cost. Like, like, you know, there was one thing, you know, it's funny just thinking about it. It really was like, I know, not to sound too cool by y'all or anything about it, but <laughs> it really was like an effort to include, like, we just included like anybody we thought was great. Mm -hmm. We would reach out to them, and you know, and more often than not, they would say, "Yeah." It's just so many people. Like for example, Tracy great, Morris, Tracy Morris, Grand was a PA. The <laughs> David Hammonds has artwork all over the graveyards. I, Gloria Naylor was, was there. Gloria, Gloria Naylor worked Naylor was with us. There. The it was really kind of incredible. She was there every day. I never, my, my David Hammond story is about this. I never forget this. It's like you know those. He has these incredible. Uh, arches made out of nitrine bottles and stuff. He gave us two of those to put in the graveyard. And after we shot, we were like, call David, hey David, you wanna get your art back? He said, oh man, don't worry about shipping it, just keep it, keep it. And we, and we were just like, oh man, we gotta get your thing back. So we finally trudged and got it back to him. But I think about that to this day. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I mean, those th like Should've when those things them. went in Southern Beach, for like, like, yeah, crazy. <laughs> Okay, let it go. It's okay. No, I always think about it though. Dang, man. It was about the only way I was going to get paid on daughters, so. <laughs> well, they call it a labor of love for a reason. But, um, but so, and the hairstyles, but the costumes also. So, what were the original costumes that you didn't end up wanting to use, and how did you come to these ones? Well, we had to have our costumes built. Um, uh, we were able to see photographs at um, the Penn's Cultural Center um, of the period, of the time period, and we had them recreated or constructed, or as they say, built. Um, and that's what we have now. But, okay. The first, yeah, I, you I don't want have to tell us if you don't want to. Last time, <laughs> you know. Okay. Excellent, well, they're beautiful. Um, and out of curiosity, where are the costumes? Well, I have two pieces um, that I retained. Uh, one of the pieces, since we, it was such a low budget production, um, we had to, the people who handmade it, a costume company, we had to give it back to them, you know. Uh, that was part of the deal. So they could use it, so that's in Savannah. We had sewers in Savannah and in uh, Charleston. Interesting. Um, okay, so you get down to St. Helena Island. Um, we have two days of a, pre a day of pre-production shooting, and then I think it, we, we said it was day 12 of shooting in the galleries upstairs, um, Alva's call sheets, which she no, generously we a, loaned. But we had four weeks, five, we had a bunch of pre-production. No, no, you had a lot more, but I'm just saying we have two of those days, so I'm just talking about the call sheets. So can you tell us about, Alva, can you tell us about the, the days of shooting that you were there, what was it like for, as an actor? <laughs> you can tell the truth, she said. Well, um, the days, of course, in film, days start very early. And uh, it's very dark and very cold. Uh, and because it's so cold, you have to wear, I wore uh, like several layers under my costume. And then by the time, and also because it was cold, and then there were all of these, uh, they're not quite gnats, but no they're no sand, no yeah. No seams. No seams, yeah. You don't see them, but they're biting you. <laughs> and, um, and so that, yeah, so then we had to, uh, so we were wearing like netting, mosquito nets all, we were off camera, we were just like trying to cover ourselves. Um, most of the f uh, scenes were shot, they were all shot with natural, in natural light with reflectors. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was early days, you know, work until the sun went down. And uh, the work on the, uh, the dialect, that was pretty intense. And memorizing all the, the, the soliloquies, um, that was also pretty intense. But it was a really, uh, it's just really quite beautiful. I remember telling um, someone I was, uh, I 
introduced with someone uh, who was writing for Elle magazine, and, and I told her, I think it's as close to heaven on earth that I'm gonna get. Because I went to a service on, in one of the churches on St. Helena, uh -huh. and it was just so profound. Uh, you know, the music was like those old gospel records that my grandmother and my great grandmother had. Um, just that gut bucket, like you're hearing like um, people banging on barrels and playing um, banjos and but it was just so pure. So, and just the sheer beauty of the location. And you just really felt, you really felt the history, particularly on St. Helena, because at the time, it was one of the only islands that hadn't been developed by um, developers f making, uh, uh, turning everything into golf courses. So, um, Many of the islands are now, are now uh, vacation spots and golf courses, and so yeah. And is St. Helena Island, is that, uh, is it like a national park or protected? Uh, no, but Hunting Island uh, is, we shot actually on like five different mm -hmm. islands. It was Hunting Island, Dota, a little bit, um, Edisto, um, St. Helena, where they had Lands End, and um, Ladies Island, maybe? Yeah, I think the, the tree, big tree was on Ladies Island, yeah. Um, and so Alva, you mentioned uh, the dialect, and so that's something else that really stands out about the film um, is the dialect that the characters speak in. So can you talk, uh, we've talked a little bit about how you worked with a dialect coach, um, but can you tell us a little bit about that and who, Ben Julie, who that person was and kind of how that all came about? Yeah, that was Ron Days. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he went on to do Gullah Gullah Island with his wife, Natalie Days, Ron and Natalie Days. Mm -hmm. So he was, he not only, he worked as a dialect coach and he also, uh, he was in the movie as well. Yeah, yeah he was the one we baptized. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a, how did, what, what kind of things did you do with him, Alva, to kind of get yourself up to speed with the dialect? Like what were, cause I'm assuming you had exercises, et cetera, I don't know. Well, um, he translated the Bible into Gullah. So he took me through this process of sort of translating all my text, all my dialogue into a Gullah um, dialect and language, I, s I, I should say, really, because it's not just a dialect, it's also a language. Um, and I think that uh, myself and all the actors, I think, took various, uh, took various attempts or, or did it in various levels. I seem to have went full, all out. I was all in. <laughs> and I look back and say, so, oh my gosh. But um, I think it is great that you went all the way in, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so, yeah. But, so what did you have? I mean, what did you do? You just had to, you read this, what he translated for you and you just kind of kept going with that? Like? Well, yeah, uh, because I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I felt to really get at the heart of the, the meaning of the core of each scene. Like I really had to understand what, not just what it meant in English, but just how, what it meant and how it was really said in Gala. So um, I'm just trying to, I can't even, uh, like something like um, uh, something trouble for C. I'm trying to remember. Like you know, that's that's like difficult for me to to see and to understand. Uh -huh. You know, that that would be the translation. Um, so yeah, it just it was a. I worked with Don, and then I just spent a lot of time sort of in solitude in my room uh -huh. with the text. And also, I got to know a couple of families very well. And um, they were gala, and I had meals with them, and of course going to church. So I, I kind of immersed myself um, in the language and the culture. And I actually went down uh, several times afterwards, and after the shooting was over, and yeah. So awesome. it stays, it stays with you. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
So AJ, you started to tell us about some of the mood and we got a little sidetracked with Carrie, but I like that. But I would really love to hear from you like as a DP specifically about the work that you did on this film. <coughs> well, I've said this before, but um, uh, the primary like, well, first of all, it's just the whole aesthetic thing, mm -hmm. you know, like aesthetically what we were trying to do. And in a sense, it was very much an extension of the whole UCLA rebellion and all this stuff. I studied with Hyla Grima mm -hmm. at Howard University. He was. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, who was. Uh, <laughs> he was a principal. He was a principal member of the UCLA rebellion. And so he, when I was at Howard University, I went there to study architecture, but he had actually got in the Howard maybe three years before I got there. It seemed like he had been there forever when I got there, but <laughs> looking back, he'd only been there like three years. So he very much came to Howard with the whole ethos. Mm -hmm. I would call it an ethos. And the ethos essentially was like, you know, the same shit I always say now. It's just like, how do we make black cinema, basically, mm -hmm. was what it was. And so we had already been thinking about and talking about what, you know, black cinematographer, so to speak, might be what that might look like. And so I highly sent me out to LA to work on Charles Burnett's second feature, uh, My Brother's Wedding. And that's when Julie and I met, actually. And, um, and so it was just a continuation of a lot of that kind of thinking. And um, in meeting Carrie, too, certainly consolidated that. I like to think, like, there's a line of, um, there's a line of thinking regarding how to treat uh, black people's complexions in film mm -hmm. that certainly precedes me, but I know like at Howard, we definitely bought it to a certain kind of head, a boiling point. And, uh, and we, you know, we, we attempted to do certain things on Daughters, and I feel like those things have gotten picked up and you can see straight through, you know, through Malik's work on like Belly and um, X Factor in particular, uh, straight through Brad's work on, uh, Mother George in particular. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was funny, like, we, when we did the restoration of Daughters, uh, you know, they asked me, oh, look at it for the color correction and stuff like this. And I went in on hard the first couple of days, and I was like, okay, I got to stop myself because I realized my whole sense of how I would handle complexion and stuff has evolved so much over the last 20 years that I had to actually take a break and step back and just try to get myself more in the head. Because I know like, I mean, it's, be, you know, I think it looks good and all like that, but I would never do complexions orange like this. The orangeness, like I really feel like warming up black people's skin is completely bound up with white supremacist ideas. And just for myself, so I always go more towards a blue thing now, a blue black thing now, so it probably, it probably wouldn't look like this if we started again, but I like, but so, but in that, in, in that kind of thinking, there was certain, you have these aesthetic ideals, which you can see like in Kara's work, it's just yeah. this commitment to putting a black figure at the center of your narrative, at the center of your picture and all this kind of stuff, at the center of your narrative. And then you have to say, well, technically, how do we pull that off? Particularly in light of the fact that all the apparatus, all the equipment, the film stocks, the cameras, all those kinds of things were not, they didn't evolve in response to optimizing black people's um, expressive uh, desires and stuff. So you have to go in and um, in a sense interrogate the apparatus, which seemingly would just be technical and with no ideological presuppositions and stuff, but that's obviously not true at all. So like on the most basic level, a really, really basic example is like with the film stocks, like a lot of times, like within the, when Daughters first came out and I would do talks, people would always ask me what film stock did you use? Mm -hmm. And I would always tell people that's the wrong question to ask because the right question would be like, why did you use the film stock that you used? Because the film stock that we used actually was discontinued right after Daughters. So it wasn't even available anymore, you know? But um, Kodak would be the default choice on most films at the time. <laughs> That's funny thinking back, Kodak barely exists anymore, but <laughs> Kodak would be like the default choice, but Kodak was engineered to optimize what they call a China doll. You may have seen it, it's like generally an Asian woman mm -hmm. with a color chart next to her head. And uh, the Asian woman's complexion was considered the ideal, like in terms of 
the white complexion. That was so. It was, so it's engineered to optimize that complexion. So as soon as you start to fall outside of it, you can't really fall outside of it in terms of being too fair. But on the dark end, as soon as you start to fall outside of it, you start getting these peculiar looks. Let's say. Uh, I remember growing up, like looking at Star Trek. Why is you here? I always look greasy and in, in, in the shadow like that. You know. Uh, <laughs> It's because of the film stock, you know, and that they were lighting for Captain Kirk or whatever, and then you just <laughs> land wherever the hell you land, you know, um, <laughs> technically speaking. So the first thing that we did, and Charles was really the first person who, like when we did my brother's wedding, they shot it on Fuji film stock, and that was the first time I can actually remember anybody actively talking about, oh, the film stocks that you choose will predispose what kinds of looks you can get. I mean, the, the, the sort of discourse around it. That's the, because we used to do testing at UCLA exactly. with various film stocks. Larry Clark in Larry particular Clark. was a person on passing through. That's a very, like, Roderick Taylor. Mm -hmm. What's uh, Roger? Yeah. Roger Young. Roger Young, yeah. yeah, the cinematographer. Amazing, amazing, amazing work. But it's really about making the skin pop in a certain kind of way or do certain kinds of things. And so on doors, we just, like, pick that up. So as soon as you have our dark skin cast in white dresses mm -hmm. on the beach in the sun, that's immediately a technical problem <laughs> more than anything else. Because you have to pick and choose. If you expose the costumes properly, then everybody is going to be like Carrie's paintings, like silhouettes mm -hmm. outside in the middle of the day. And if you expose people's complexion, then it's going to be like close encounters of the third kind. Everybody's <laughs> going to like be glowing. And so, I mean, one of the most striking sort of disjunctions of actually being on the set versus seeing the film, like people oftentimes say, oh, those dresses are so white and stuff. But anybody who actually was on the set and the dresses was like the colors of this wall. Yeah, we dyed they them. They had to be very dipped. dark, orange. Yeah, you have to dip them when you feel them. Yeah, because technically, I remember sitting with Alva, mm -hmm. Trula, and maybe Barbara, oh, we did these tests, and I had them, three of them sit in front of a color chart, and then we had the dresses dyed to different levels of darkness, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I exposed everybody properly, and then I underexposed like six stops mm -hmm. in half stop increments, and then I had the lab print everything back to perfect, and we made a decision based on, okay, at this exposure, at this certain point, it's gonna optimally capture Alva, Barbara O. Jones and the costumes. In other words, we made the costumes darker than they actually were to your eye, so that when we overexposed in order to expose the, the uh, complexions properly, it would burn the color out of the dresses. Thank you. That's incredible. Yeah, which actually, if you remember, uh, Arlene Burks, the costume person, she was actually upset at first because she didn't understand. She had never seen that done before, and so she was a little upset. Ruining she thought she dresses, thought we were yeah. ruining her her costumes, but actually we were optimizing them. Well, and you were optimizing them for to be yeah. seen on film, um, not necessarily by the eye. Um, that thank you, AJ. That is really incredible, and thank you guys for for doing that. Like that's a lot of work, honestly. And there's a really no. I mean, I'm serious. A lot of work to create something <laughs> beautiful. Um, so we're going to open it up for a couple of questions from the audience right now. And there is a mic over here. Um, and Lauren, my colleague, will facilitate that. So if you have a question, please come to the mic. Um, I don't know how many we're going to take, so I apologize in advance if the answer is not enough. Nobody has any questions? Oh, hey, there you go. <laughs> gonna pass up this chance <laughs> um, it's just such an honor to like talk to you guys today thank you so much for making this film um, it's touched me since I first saw it in college and I mean I know everyone here feels the same way so just thank you so much um, so well I have like two questions but I'll just the first one you have this um, you know narrative this continuous narrative going and I was wondering, like, w why did you choose to have the omnipotent narrative as opposed to letting the dialogue tell the story? Um, as far as, um, like, the, you know, like, the, the 
someone talking in their mind, sort of the, the unborn child telling a story, and then um, you have the, the grandmother sort of, um, you know, uh, just <laughs> kind of, yeah. I don't know. If yeah, you we, could, we got you, it, we got it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> No, oh, uh, um, do you got it? Yeah. No, I don't got it. <laughs> I think, let me paraphrase. What I, what I think that you're asking is about the choice to have the film narrated by the unborn child, right? The kind yeah. of omniscient narrator yeah. um, it in was, the voiceover. It was, several, it was several of those. It was mm -hmm. Alba's character was narrating the film and telling a story. And, you know, usually with like a streamlined No, film the story is just being uh, narrated by uh, the great-great-grandmother, Nana Pazant, and the unborn child. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I was trained formally as a writer, and of course I know that you could only have one narrator in a film, <laughs> but I would decided that this particular story needed to, needed to be told from the point of view of the eldest living family member and the youngest, and the youngest indeed was the unborn child, the child inside of you is stomach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. this parallel dialing, dueling dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want to thank you again. I saw it when it was released um, back in the day, and it was amazing seeing it again, especially seeing Verda May there. So oh, I just yeah. want to thank you. And my question is, um, how did it do, you know, back when it was first released and, and you know, it was in theaters? And I, mm -hmm. as I said, I remember seeing it. I loved it. It changed my life. But I never kind of kept track of, you know, how did it do and what, what impact did it have? It's... Interestingly enough, it is never, in the 26 years since it was made, it has never stopped playing somewhere in the world. And when it was playing the first run at the, after the film foreign, it went to the New York Village East, and I believe it played for 36 consecutive weeks. I, I could just, uh, there were a couple of things like, I remember at the time, like it started off at Film Forum, uh, it sold out, it kept getting extended, and then it had to move. And I remember people saying like, that's normally if you move a film from one theater to another, if it has a long run, that's like the end of it. It just never, but they'd never seen a film that moved, because it moved from that to cinema. Uh, New York Village East. I think New, New York, New York Village East, exactly. And it just kept going, you know. Um, and it had to move because of the scheduling. Yeah, the schedule. Form. They just they couldn't. They no couldn't idea. extend it anymore. Yeah, they had yeah. no idea it was gonna keep selling out. So yeah, it, and it the well. thing, and I, you know, I just remember like in particular, in terms of how I did. Well, you know, that's a, that's a complicated kind of question. I mean, I think oftentimes like it did amazing, given like. I mean, I think like what was something like Doors do in the time of social media? You know, this was like yeah. pre-social media. And it was like word of mouth to yeah, a large degree. Was, People yeah. were like really rolling out to see it pretty hardcore. And um, I always think that, um, you know, it's, a, it's the Malcolm Gladwell thing, the long tail versus the short tail, you know? And basically what he says is like different ways of judging the success of something as a commodity because I like, I think, I mean, maybe it's not to compare daughters to kind of blue, but in a sense, like the kind of blue was never on the billboards chart. It was never like a top 100 or anything like that, but it also never went out of print in the last 50 something years. So it's a little like that. Maybe, you know, it's the hare and the turtle. It's just <laughs> still going. So in time, I feel like this is the part of me that's really proud of it and feels somewhat arrogant about being proud of it. It's like there were a lot of films came out in the heyday of the black film thing and they've come and gone and Doris is still <laughs> Chugging away, still chugging away, still, you know, creating audiences for itself. And in a lot of ways, I think, still pointing point a direction, you know, in the future. A lot of stuff, you look back at it, you can't even watch it now. It just looks very dated, you know. So anyway, just on a... Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you. And I think agreed. We, you can be fully proud, arrogant or not, about it. Um, can we have a next person? Hello. Um, the first thing I'd like to say is um, I'm very grateful to be here. I remember seeing you, Miss Dash, on um, Turner Classic Movies, uh, standing in for Robert Osborne. And I just feel so much more excited to be here and see you here. Um, How did I do? 
excellently killed it. That just did the most. So I was excited about that for a whole lot of other reasons. But my question for you is, um, I think more of a logistical one about production and production in that particular location. Um, uh, obviously it was a period piece. Did you, did you and your cast, the crew and cast sort of fit in and meld in quite easily with whoever was in the local surroundings from something that Ms. Rogers had said earlier, it seemed like yes. Um, but if you could speak a little bit to that. And also, um, did you feel like you bumped into any hegemonic influences, I guess in terms of maybe, like that might have been negative because you were in South Carolina after all, um, getting permits to film or in any way, did you think that based on the geographic environment, like regional environment, there were any difficulties in getting your work off the ground other than what any filmmaker normally experiences anyway? Okay. Uh, <laughs> we went down, they knew us by the time we came back the second time. Oh. Uh, uh, and um, we hired, all of the children and the elders were from, were locals. And they worked right. with us every day. <laughs> yeah. And we also hired a lot of other people who were locals. Uh, and we brought out the whole hotel there, that, that Royal Frogmore Inn where we stayed. Wow. We had a lot of people working. Um, they embraced us, uh, and we embraced them <laughs> as well. Um, the Sea Island Stingers came to celebrate us. I mean, we, we, we enjoyed going to their churches. It was just, it was, it was very much of a community type of uh, filmmaking effort, I think. And, um, uh, the caterer, Sergeant, what was his name, Sergeant Smith or Sergeant something, he was a, he, he was a, a local Marine who started a catering business, so we hired him. And, and it, was, it, was, it was a great experience. Um, and I hope that our impact on the community was, was just as good and just as fruitful and, you know, I hope so. I, I went back there um, about a month ago uh, the unborn child is like a mother of three. <laughs> uh, one of the other little girls, young girls, peasant daughters, she just retired from the Navy. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing. The, one of the uh, boatmen I, I met again, he was down there too. So it, it had a, a, a good impact, I think, on in their lives, and, and that's a good thing because you don't want to come in like the, the circus is in town and and disrupt things and, 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 and cause problems. So I think we did a good job and they, they, they were like family to us. Thank you. Hi there, I just wanna say this, this movie's always been fabulous to me. I've been watching it for, for since the, when we first came out with it. But I've never found a score, a soundtrack for it. And I love the music, the dialogue, and I was wondering, wondering if there was any anything that ever came out in regards to The that. mystical, magical music is, was composed by John Barnes. And wow. um, we are still working on that. We tried at the time to get, um, to get a soundtrack made from it and there were, it, we, it didn't happen. It couldn't happen. Okay. Um, but we still talk about it. So yeah, it is a wonderful score. I mean, he composed Unbelievable it. score. Music was he composed the score in 10 days. 10 days? In 10 days, yeah. Uh, he would go into a trance and, and just write and compose. And he, he composed it kind of like a, a, the, each, each character had an aria. And he composed them according to their, um, uh, the African deity that they represented as well as their um, astrological sign that we assigned to each of them. Right. And uh, <laughs> so it was like, it was really deep. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping it does come out at some point because I would love to, to own it. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell them. <laughs> All right. Tell them. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Excellent film. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks for being here with us today. Um, I'm Amelia, and my, my family's from a few islands south of where you shot, which is mostly golf courses now, like you guys have said. And I wanted to ask two questions. How was the film received by, um, you said that you had family who were Gullah Geechee. How was it received by them and by other people, like the finished product, actually? 
And then the second question is, your book um, is amazing. And I'm curious about the decision to write a sequel as a book and sort of um, what, what led to that decision and also just if you could talk a bit about your practice as a writer too. Oh, the, the writing of the book was very humbling to me <laughs> because I'm used to writing screenplays. Um, and then I was kind of disappointed in the end because they insisted on calling the book Daughters of the Dust as well when I had written the book under the title of uh, Geechee Recollections. And the publishers didn't want that. They, they wanted it to be Daughters of the Dust because even though they had not even they weren't familiar with the film. They knew that the film was out, and so they said, well, we can market it better as Daughters of the Dust. Um, I wanted to do, it's the second, it's part two. <laughs> it's the continuing story of the Pazant family, and I very much wanted to, to make that film. Um, so far it hasn't happened, but that doesn't mean it will not happen, yes. <laughs> Hi. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Sayla. I wanted to thank you also for being here today. I'm really excited. Uh, I just graduated from a film program and I actually did my ending project on you. Um, and I'm, yes, I'm really excited to be here. Um, <laughs> um, I actually wanted to ask about how do you feel about seeing the imagery of this body of work or different images or reflections in current? bodies of work by other people, even though it seemed from what I researched that uh, Eurocentric Hollywood wasn't as receptive mm -hmm. um, when this film was released. I just wanted to know your thoughts about seeing it and how it's being accepted now. Um, do you have any particular films in mind? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> um, so even some of the cinematography, um, if Mr. Jaffa, uh, I can see reflected in, of course, you were also talking about the, the moonlight and the, you know, the black blue looks like newer movies that have come out also in, um, I'm not sure, maybe I'm just making this up, but I've seen in Beyonce's works of Lemonade, definite, <laughs> definite visual portrayals uh, that reflect this body of work. So I just wanted to know how you felt about it being reflected now and so widely accepted, but back then the LA Rebellion was not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We love Lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> lemonade, uh, it's, it's, it's all part of a continuum, um, the same sensibilities, and we, we love it, we applaud it, we wanna see more of it, and um, yeah, we're very pleased. Yeah, and I could just to add one thing to that. Um, you know, it's funny. It's like stuff, stuff not accidental. Like Judy said, it's a continuum. I mean, if you actually scratch the credits on that stuff, it's always like, you know, say, a little bit of separation. Because like even on Lemonade, like between, I like, I work with Malik Sa Saeed on Formation. Mm -hmm. We have some stuff that we shot in Lemonade. Khalil Josephs, mm -hmm. who is an associate of ours super incredibly talented filmmaker, you know, obviously knows the whole body of work and knows not just the body of work, but knows a lot of the thinking behind it, you know, so. And the aesthetics of Solange. Yeah, exactly. So it's not an accident, you know. I mean, you know, I think people, it was a hit in the beginning. People responded to the look positively in the beginning and people responded to the look positively in Lemonade. So it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Audra. Um, I was a 20-year-old journalism student, and you granted us an interview, um, Ms. Dash, uh, for a magazine, a little magazine that had six issues called Noir. So I want to thank you for that again. <laughs> it was amazing. It was the first published um, outside of my college newspaper article that I'd ever had. And um, I asked you this question then, and you wouldn't answer it. So. <laughs> And, you know, we were, we were in that uh, first round of your showings at Film Forum. We, my journalism class and I saw your film three times together in the Film Forum sh running. And we asked you then um, who, it's a storytelling question. We wanted to know who, the, who raped her, who was the oh. villain. 
because our question then was, you know, this was family. Everyone there was technically related, and it seemed kind of more horrific than ever that oh, there was this uh, unnamed villain. I didn't answer that. Oh, it was you uh, a plant, you know, someone from the mainland, you know. Yeah. Someone white from the mainland, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that was just a question I always had. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hey, oh, AJ. Okay. Hello, I'm Mila. Um, I'm a film student at the New School in the grad program in Media Studies. Um, and I've only just been introduced to your work in the last two years of my life, so it's been amazing for me coming from like a family in the Midwest and Mississippi as well. Um, and with that, the theme of family being in the center of this film, I'm really curious about um, how you worked with your actors and maybe non-actors preparing for the film because there's so many scenes that are so reminiscent, I think, for a lot of us within the diaspora uh, of playing with our little cousins and our siblings and, and especially the girls and the boys and, and grandma sitting around and telling you stories that feed into that oral family history. I'm really curious about how you prepared um, your cast as well as your crew for these scenes to make them feel more authentic. Well, great question. Well, the first thing I did was I prepared a background sheets, histories about the region, about uh, the people, about the culture, and then um, about the, what I felt the, the, the characters, who they are and who they ought to be, uh, knowing that actors always bring their own choices. Um, this was the only film I've ever made where I had rehearsal time. We had about a week of rehearsal. And all of the other films I ever made, um, even, you know, you know, Rosa Parks story or Funny Valentines or what have you, there's no rehearsal anymore. So we were, I really miss having rehearsal time. So we, we rehearsed um, in, on St. Helena uh, for about a week, yeah? And, um, and we also played volleyball together. <laughs> did you, did I just wanted to know, did you have any like exercises that you did with them, volleyball was one of the exercises. <laughs> no, truly. No, that's what, that's what we did to, uh, so people uh, would uh, learn to relax and to trust one another and to, and to build intimacy. Uh, we were able to play volleyball and then we, we did group rehearsals and then we did one-on-one um, uh, -on -one rehearsals and then sometimes just two characters together, rehearsals. And sometimes we reversed their roles like Alva would take Eli's dialogue, yeah. <laughs> you know, Michael, and, and then they'd play against each other to find, to discover what's in there, that, uh, what kind of emotions that they could find in there. Well, thank so, you, and I thank you for the wide range of characters. I feel like I saw so many family members and aunties and cousins in the film, so thank you so much for that. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, peace, Mr. Jaffa, Ms. Rogers, and Ms. Dash. Um, I went to Howard. I was the one we out. Um, I love Howard. Um, but nonetheless, um, I want to I want to thank you just as everyone else has uh, for this film because um, not only are the themes very the themes are very essential to us as Africans in America uh, with the intergenerational exchange, but then also this continuum of African culture thriving in America and just the uh, variations and nuances of it being in a foreign land. Um, just going on this notion of uh, uh, the, what the person said before me, uh, this notion of like the aunties and uncles and having the mama uh, teach like different teach different uh, words and the translations of what it was in the Geechee language to America to American English. Um, but just honing in on that notion of the intergenerational exchange and going to Howard, one of my first introductions at Howard, um, I studied Afro-American studies, Africana studies, and um, one of my first introductions was by Dr. Carr and him advising for me to uh, watch the film Daughters of the Dust. And I saw it and it blew my mind. Um, and with that being said, along with the notion of the importance of intergenerational exchange, because I feel like that's something that's lack thereof right now. Um, it's not very, it's not, it, it's, it's not very, it, it's not done, it's not done. Um, I feel like it's, 
I feel like uh, it, we're able to assess like elders or assess um, people, the generation before us through like very myopic means, if that makes sense. Um, so with that being said, I, put, I present the question to you, Ms. Dash. Um, can you mentor me? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, curiously enough, I am at Howard right now. I took Haile Garima's class this year so he could go out and shoot this year. So I was there all of 2016 and into 2017 for Haile. Wow. So um, email me. <laughs> but wait, wait, but I, I'll, I'll know your email. Like, what's, what's, what's your email? Like, do I? You can find her afterwards. I know, all right, I got you. <laughs> okay, and our last question. Thank you. Uh, I have, like, five questions. <laughs> I, I studied journalism at Howard. I promise they're very good. Um, <laughs> my, uh, you want them all five at once, or you want to hear them? I'll let you pick the ones. Why that you are you? Yeah, let her pick one. There you go. All right. So, question number one is, uh, what if any literary influences you drew from in creating Daughters of the Dust? Question number two is, um, can I say the literary ones? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, praise sure. song for a widow, Paulie Marshall. Okay. What was that again for a widow? It feels like a pop quiz. Um, the second question was that um, the tension between tradition and assimilation is a big theme in the, in the movie. It's the overarching theme. Um, and I'm wondering how you see that in your lineage today. Um, you want to answer oh, that or keep um, going? I think that goes on um, with every generation because every, the younger generation is always pushing to move towards growth and change and the... Uh, uh, elders in the family always saying, no, stay right here. Okay. Thank you. Um, before I ask you the last two, I just want, I really want to say thank you for this movie. I meant to say this in the beginning, but um, every time I watch Stories of the Dust, first of all, I cry all the way through, and I'm, because I'm so grateful that I made the cut as a black woman. It's like, oh. whew, almost did, but I'm there. <laughs> um... um my last two questions are really quick, and I, I wonder if you've read Homegoing by Yad Jesse and um, what you think of it. And the question after that is, is there a gumbo recipe? Is, it, is there a gumbo, you say gumbo? A gumbo recipe. Oh, yes. Uh, no, I have not read um, Homegoing. Um, and there are many gumbo recipes. Um, in fact, I'm um, working on a, a documentary right now uh, called Travel Notes of the Geechee Girl about Verda Mae Smart Grosvenor from her book, <laughs> Vibration Cooking. And we've interviewed about 22 people and everyone has their own gumbo recipe to the point where we're having gumbo wars. So yes, <laughs> <laughs> there are many gumbo recipes, in, but I do have my own. Thank you all very much. Thank you.